All right. Well, today we're going to begin a new series. It's called uh, Blessed Writings on the Wall, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. But um, first of all, I was just reflecting on how uh, wonderful weekends are. Are we all in agreement that weekends are pretty cool? I mean, weekends are really great for one reason is we can kind of let go, kind of get uh, out of our lanes and kind of let go of those usual rituals, those routines that we have to keep up with during the week, right? Like, for instance, we might not set the alarm for the same time as usual. We might not hit the floor at the same time as we always do. We might even change up those morning routines of breakfast and shower and all that kind of stuff because we don't have to do the usual routines that we usually have to do to keep us on track so that we can get out of the house and get to our jobs and start all of our routines and our our rituals and our customs there. All the things that we need to do, really, in order to uh, live a good life, in order to support our families, in order to do the things we, we need to do. So it's nice to, once in a while, once a week, kind of let those rituals, those customs, those routines go. But we could not last very long if we didn't have them during the week, right? It's that discipline. It's that consistency. It's that those rituals and those routines that really begin to define uh, who we are, our character, that helps us to remain on track, that helps us to develop those good work habits, all those things that really do point to and are predictive of our success in life. We have to have those routines and those, that kind of discipline. And to the extent that we pass those on to our children, those good habits, we are actually also predictive of their success in their lives. So those very little routines, those little things that we don't think much of, they really do add up. And they add up to uh, being the things we do that are predictive of our health and our good success uh, in the future. Now, as it is with people and with families, so it is with nations. Edmund Burke, the statesman from the uh, 18th century, he said that nations have a responsibility, get this, a responsibility to reinforce feelings of national pride and national purpose by the use of ritual and the use of certain customs. Now, he was pointing to those things that help us connect with our patriotism and things that help us connect with remembrance of what's gone in the past, but they all add up to those rituals and customs without which a nation, especially one like ours, that's not bound together by ethnicity or, or, or race. Nations hold together by the use of these, these symbols and these, these customs that we hold in common. They bind us together. Well, this month we're going to be looking at some of the customs, some of the rituals, uh, some of the prophecies in the Scripture that point to Jesus, all of those things that come out of the Old Testament that point to Jesus, point to His resurrection, and also point to and help us be bound together as a church, as a people, as we move uh, through history together. It's called Blessed Writings on the Wall, and it takes its inspiration from an Old Testament story in the book of Daniel. And some of you may be familiar with this story. It comes in Daniel chapter 5, and it tells the story of a king who saw once literal writings on the wall that foretold, that were predictive of his future. The story goes that King Belshazzar was once with all of his nobles. He was in a big banquet hall, and there were a thousand of his nobles there. And the spirits were really high that night, you know, and the wine was flowing as, you know, you might expect. And King Belshazzar, he uh, gets it in his mind that he wants to have the gold and silver goblets, gold and silver goblets that had been taken from the temple in Jerusalem. 
when his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had invaded uh, Judah and the temple had come down, they plundered the temple and brought back lots of stuff, but part of it, their plunder were these gold and silver goblets that had once been used in the temple of God. So he calls for these, these things to be brought to him, and because he's the king, it, it happens. And they bring those goblets, and Scripture says that the king and his concubines and his wives, they all drank from them. So they drank from these goblets, these sacred goblets that had been in that temple in Jerusalem. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron, of wood and stone. So they take these, these sacred goblets and now they're praising these, these phony gods, these gods that are just of material things, that have no real power at all. So they're, they're toasting and praising these, go these gods. And as they do that, suddenly something happens that I think probably sobered everybody up. As they're doing these toasts, they see a finger, a disembodied hand, appear. It said, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. And the king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. <laughs> this powerful king is just completely freaked out by this disembodied hand writing on the wall. Well, the hand disappeared, and nobody could figure out what this writing was. It was a language that nobody understood. So the king, he called his enchanters and astrologers and diviners, and they came, and they tried to figure it out, and they couldn't do it either. So finally, someone had the bright idea to call Daniel. Now, Daniel was a Jew who had been taken in that Babylonian invasion and brought to this place as a slave. But he had a reputation as one who could interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve difficult problems. So as a last resort, they called in Daniel. And Daniel took a look at this writing. He said, yeah, king, I can... I can interpret this for you. I can read it. He says, here is what these words mean. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. This literal writing on the wall foretold the doom and the failure of this king. But the fact of it is, even though that literal writing on the wall predicted his doom and his failure, his doom and his failure had been already in the works. It had been predicted long before, set up long before by his actions by his actions as a king. Before Daniel interpreted the words, he took a moment to face the king and tell him some things about himself that he probably wished he'd have heard before, but he heard it now. He said to him that unlike his father Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar had never acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone He wishes. He says, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. You have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You've had these goblets brought from the temple and brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank from them. He says, you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life. 
And it was true, even in this moment of disrespect to God with these goblets, it was indicative of the decadence of his kingdom. The writing was on the wall for this guy long before the hand appeared. The writing was on the wall because of his actions, his disrespect, his disregard uh, for God. And that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. Now, ever since that time, that expression, writing on the wall, has been associated with predictions of doom and failure. But as you know, you don't need a writing on the wall to predict doom and failure in the future. It happened in Daniel's time before that invasion of the Babylonians. At that time, the prophet Isaiah was writing, and he was looking at the writing on the wall. He was looking at the actions of the people in Judah at the time, how they had slowly been taking themselves away from God, pulling themselves away from God, and turning to the worship, again, of idols, of idols of stone and wood and and gold and silver, material things. And listen, this is something that we all, every human being has a problem with, of really putting our trust in those material things, really making them the object of our worship. And it makes sense because we're material people, you know. It's hard sometimes to put God first. But that's what they'd been doing in, this, in, the, in, the, in the land of Judah and in Israel. And it, Isaiah could see the writing on the wall that that was going to lead to their calamity. So he went to the king at the time, whose name was Hezekiah, and he said, A time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up to to this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away. Every single one of these things happened because he could see the writing on the wall. As they moved further from God, bad things were bound to happen. Now, I don't want to be a big downer on Sunday, you know, but (laughs) it is the beginning of Lent. (laughs) And I have to say, sometimes when I look around at our nation, don't you sometimes feel that maybe, maybe the writing is on the wall and we're heading in kind of a, a dicey direction? I mean... What we do is predictive of our future, right? What does it say about us as a, as a nation when a good number of the people in our country celebrate abortion, the, the extinguishing of almost a million lives a year? And they celebrate that as a human right. Writing's on the wall, right? Well, what does that say about us? What does it say about, what's it predictive of? How does it portend for us that uh, in schools, children as little as five years old, it's suggested to them that they can choose their own gender. I mean, fundamentally confusing children about the fundamental things about themselves. What does it say? What's it portend for us? That so little attention is given to the disintegration of the family and the crippling effects of fatherlessness in our nation. What's it say about us? What's the writing on the wall? Back when that Babylonian invasion was almost 
come to pass. God, through Isaiah, spoke these words. He said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Mix everything up. Again, I don't want to be a big downer, but I mean, sometimes don't you look at the newspaper and you think that sounds pretty relevant, doesn't it? The writing can be on the wall. But listen, even though when we look around, the writing on the wall seems to be portending doom and failure. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not a pessimistic guy. I, I really do uh, think that there's so much good in this world. And there's so much grace. And there's so much goodness. And the reason I believe that is because even though the writing on the wall sometimes looks like, oh, man, we are really headed for big trouble, I know from this book and I know from, from knowing God, that no matter how far we stray from Him, He always opens a way for us to return. He always opens up that pathway to repentance. It doesn't matter how far we get as individuals or as families or as a nation from God. There's always a way opened up back to Him. Even when that Babylonian invasion was imminent, even as Isaiah was predicting doom and failure for his people. Even within that, God said these words through Isaiah, comfort, comfort my people, says my God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service, all of the things that had come down, come crashing down on them because of what they'd done in the past, all that hard service has been completed. He's seeing in the future their redemption and their, their restoration. He says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. There's always this channel of return and repentance. That passage pointed these people who were in despair towards that hope. And it also pointed towards the coming of a Savior who we know is Jesus, who always gives us, no matter where we are, always gives us that way home, that way back, that way to health and prosperity and goodness within ourselves and our families and even in our nation. So no matter how far we seem to have come, no matter how maybe our faith has faltered, no matter how our fervor for Christ may have faded over, the t over time, God always gives us a way back, always gives us that way back through repentance and through Christ. He always gives us a way become strong again and faithful to Him. About 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul was writing a letter to the church in Corinth, a church that he had planted, but a church that within just that short amount of time, just within that 25 years, had already begun to falter had already begun to lose its way. This church, for whatever more moral and ethical strength it once had, it was already beginning to just see those things erode away under this acid drip of, of false uh, witness, false uh, teaching, and pagan worship. But what he did to draw them back was he reconnected them reconnected them to first principles. And he did that through a, what's considered now or known now to be one of the earliest creeds found in the Bible. He 
took this people that was confused and lost, and he said to them, this is what I've received, and I pass on to you as of first importance. And then he connects them to this creed, this, 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 this catalog of first beliefs. He said that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at once to draw them back, to help them find themselves again. He connected them to this ritual, to this creed, to this custom. That helped them understand who they were. Friends, that's what we do. Whenever we gather together, as is our custom, we again grab hold of those first principles. Whenever we do things like this past Wednesday, we all gathered here to commemorate Ash Wednesday. And we participated in a custom, in a tradition of this church where we went and took time to reflect at different stations. Reflect on our decision to pray for one another. About our reliance upon Christ. About our need for and to offer and to accept reconciliation. We pondered those things that, were, that have grabbed hold of us throughout this year that we need deliverance from, and we offered those to the fire of the Holy Spirit. We took time just to think about and contemplate who Jesus is to us. We took each one of those, those times together, those rituals, those customs, to reconnect ourselves to Christ and reconnect ourselves uh, to our faith. This is what we need to do every single day so that we can remain strong, so that the things we do today will be predictive of our future, a good and successful and solid future, and the success of our church. Well, next week, we are going to continue in this series. We're going to be talking about how some very, very early writings in the Bible are predictive of our battle with Satan, our battle with evil, and how that's going to conclude. But this week, let's just remember when King Belshazzar read this writing on the wall when it was read to him, it said this, You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. This week, let's not be in a position of being found wanting in our faith. Let's see if we can, with everything we do, be found faithful. Let's see if we can, with everything we do, Make those things predictive, strong and vibrant faith moving forward. That those can be the writing on the wall for us and for our families and even for our nation. Amen? Okay.